Hey. Hey, hey. You are in, in living color. It's been, uh, it's been a while. Uh, it has been welcome. a while. It has been. I want to welcome everybody uh, to this Facebook Live, uh, a new series that we're starting at my church uh, on Sunday mornings talking about prayer. Uh, has made me want to do this, a new series on Facebook Live once a week where I'm going to reach out to a, to a friend and uh, just talk about that subject of prayer. So today I wanted to kick it off by reaching out to Michael Catt, longtime pastor right here in Albany at Sherwood Baptist Church, executive producer on all the Sherwood films, uh, and just just a friend. I, Michael, I, I miss hanging out with you and getting to have breakfast and and talk about like these subjects face to face. Oh, listen, uh, it was always fun when we got together. Of course, when when we got together for breakfast, it usually kind of rolled toward lunch, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and the waitress kept coming by, y'all want to leave the table now? You want to leave the table now? <laughs> we had a good time, but Michael, look, I, I learned so much and just appreciate you, um, you know, being generous with your time like that. It, it meant a lot. And so I wanted to kind of share one of these videos with with my friends, with with our friends, uh, just on that subject to prayer. So what I'm going to do each week is I'm going to ask two questions exactly the same, and that's going to be, why do you pray and how do you pray? And then I want to ask a couple of questions about things that I know are near and dear to your heart. So let's just lead off with that. Uh, okay. Michael, like, why do you pray? Well, I, I think the obvious thing is that the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. They did not say, Lord, teach us to preach a three-point alliterated outline. They did not say, uh, teach us to do miracles. Uh, they didn't say, teach us to do anything else except teach us to pray. And of course, you know, the greatest example of failure was in the Garden of Gethsemane. When the three guys that were the most intimately acquainted with great moments in the life of Christ fell asleep. <laughs> When Jesus said, you know, couldn't you watch and pray with me for one hour? Uh, I don't think you can read the Psalms. I don't think you can read the prayers of Paul. Uh, the, the model prayer, uh, especially uh, John 17, where we get to listen in and eavesdrop on Jesus talking to the Father and uh, inviting us into intimacy with God, not this hail, O great one who sits on a throne far beyond our reach, but Father. Uh, and I think all of us, whether we had a great relationship with our dads or a bad relationship, wish we could call a great dad and say anything we needed to say, and he would still love us. Whether it's doubt, fear, anger, resentment, uh, don't want to forgive, whatever it is. And so I think you pray to, to keep your attitude right. Because um, it's hard to pray. And I mean, we can all preach and teach and have conversations and blow smoke screens. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think prayer is a whole different ballgame. It's like Tom Ellis said, he was praying one time at a big, big event, and he was on the platform with several people, but Miss Bertha Smith, probably the most famous missionary in Southern Baptist life, was on the platform with him, and she basically tapped him on the shoulder and told him to just just be quiet, you know, start praying, learn to start praying. <laughs> so I, I think scripture commands it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you can get around it. Yeah. So, so you know, decades of, of, of Christian leadership, of ministry, of being a pastor, decades of just walking with Jesus as a disciple, how do you pray? What, what have you learned about a personal practice of prayerfulness that, that we would benefit from, from hearing, from knowing? Wow. Uh, you know, I still consider myself an amateur and a novice in the realm of prayer. I know people who are intercessors, and I mean, they are really called and gifted to intercession, I think, and, and just as a little detour, I think every guy that preaches and teaches needs to find those people. They're, they're his prayer band, they're his prayer 
circle. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, uh, you know, the Bible says pray without ceasing. Mm -hmm. And I think we minimize moments, Chad, when some random thought comes to our mind or some person comes to our mind and we have not thought about them in a while or we wake up in the middle of the night. Like I, I woke up uh, two nights ago at, at uh, three o'clock in the morning and I had a particular person that came to mind. And so, you know, I prayed and when I knew he would be awake at a more decent hour, um, you know, I sent him a text message and said, here's what I'm praying for you. And so I, I think the spontaneous nature of prayer I mean, we we have the instances where Jesus went off to pray. Mm -hmm. uh, but then Paul says, pray without ceasing. And um, I think limiting prayer to, I do it from 6.30 to 7, or I do it from 5 to 5.30, in some ways that can become legalistic. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we're like the guy in the Gospel of Matthew that when they pray, they do really big words so that people go, wow. And um, I tell you, a lot of my praying is, Lord, I don't know what to do, hmm. uh, but my eyes are on you. Hmm. I, I think we're in a battle every day. And I think an admission of desperation and helplessness is a part of praying. I mean, me going through my cancer treatments, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know this. There's nothing that I can do on my own to fix this. I mean, God's got to fix this. And I think another thing about how to pray is we get scared to bother people. You know, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to bother them and ask them to pray about this. Hey, if you're worried about it, you ought to pray about it. And if you're praying about it, you ought to have people you could call and say, here's what's going on. I need you to pray. I mean, somebody called us yesterday. They had a big, big, big situation going on in their lives. And Terry answered the phone and she came downstairs and said, hey, this is going on. And I wrapped up what I was doing and I went upstairs and we just stopped it you know, three o'clock in the afternoon and just brought that particular petition before the Lord. Um, you, you know the old saying, general prayers, general answers, specific prayers, specific answers. Um, I, I always liked the, what Ron Dunn said when he'd go to a church and some guy would say, Lord, bless those for whom it is our duty to pray. And he said, I always wanted to speak up and say, well, name one. <laughs> just, just name somebody. <laughs> Who's in our, bless the gift and the giver. Uh, you know, um, and in the how-tos personally and corporately, I, I think we've moved away from prayer corporately and, uh, it's become nothing more than really a transition for the praise team to get off the platform rather than a specific time of prayer. Uh, I mean, like, you know, I'm looking on Facebook at this tragic death of this Albany State football player. I mean, should not our churches pause and pray? Uh, that's a grieving family. That's a grieving university in a town that uh, you are still called to be there and be a shepherd in that city. And so how to, well, sometimes it's just as obvious as what's in front of you. Right. Um, I, I, I saw a guy on Twitter the other day that said, would you pre please pray for my wife? She's in ICU with COVID. And then he followed it with this, Chad. Every time she sees a post about prayer, whether she knows the people or not, she pauses and prays for them by name. Now that's, that's not hard. I mean, it doesn't have to be a 30 minute prayer, but 
to me, the how to is, I think we can get legalistic mm -hmm. uh, with our prayer time and we go through, check our boxes, you know, like I brought my Bible to Sunday school right. and not just say, let's just pray in the moment. Let's just pray in the moment. Um, I used to have a sticker on my car right after I got saved in the Jesus movement uh, on the dashboard that said, pray at the start, praise at the stop. And literally, I pray before I started my drive and I praise God that I got there safely, you know, when I got there. Um, spontaneous. I think prayer should be a lot more spontaneous than it is. And I need to be more spontaneous about it. Yeah, Michael, I so appreciate, you know, hearing, hearing that need for, for us just to be more sensitive to the Spirit. And I don't mean that in a aggrandized way, but simply if God puts something on our hearts, let's receive that and, and move towards right. prayer. But I also heard you talk about, you know, how you found Jesus in the midst of the, of the, of the Jesus movement. And right. I know that revival is near and dear to your heart. I know it's something you talk about a lot, you preach about a lot, you pray for all the time. I don't think we've had one of those early morning breakfasts where we didn't end up talking about revival for an extended yeah, period yeah, of time. Yeah. So what is the link between all those three things in, in your mind, the, our prayerfulness, our sensitivity to the spirit, and, and this burden to see God move in a remarkable way once again? How do those all tie together for you? Well, I love studying the history of revival in the Old Testament. I think there are a lot of people that study the history of revival in the last 2000 years, but God always raised up one person uh, to pray and to call the people to repentance, usually a prophet, many times one of the kings, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is amazing to me <laughs> in light of the political world we live in, you know, when have in our lifetimes, and I'm a, I'm a little bit further down the road than you, but when in our lifetimes has any political leader really, really called us to a day of prayer and fasting? Mm -hmm. uh, I think every revival in history has begun with prayer. I think it's birthed out of desperation I think it's uh, birthed out of an awareness that uh, what I said earlier, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. The enemy is, we're not knocking down the gates of hell. The enemies overrun our churches. And uh, it, it doesn't take the whole church. It just takes a remnant. You know, Vance Havner used to say, I, I'm not preaching to the crowd. I'm preaching to the remnant. Uh, I want to raise the remnant up in their awareness. I think you cannot separate prayer and revival. It's a little odd to say this, but prayer leads to revival. And then there's a third side of that coin. Revival leads to evangelism. Because out of every great revival has come a massive influx of people. I mean, the, the height of baptisms for young people in Southern Baptist life was 400,000 at the height of the Jesus movement. We've never even come close. And we've got a whole lot more programs. We've got more youth ministers. You know, we've got more bells and whistles and buildings and everything else. But what we don't have is prayer. Uh, and I think it's like, well, Lord, if we need you, we'll let you know. Um, so I think a, a great revival leads to great evangelism, and it also leads to great social awareness. Mm -hmm. Because out of revival has come uh, the end of child labor. It has come the end of slavery. Uh, it has come in workplace changes, in the building of hospitals and orphanages. I mean, you cannot deny that prayer led people to revival and then revived churches and revived people said, what has God put us here for? And they started pushing back the darkness. Hmm. Well, if it, if it starts in our churches with prayerfulness, what do you think local churches like mine can do to recapture a, a focus on the, the discipline of prayer? the practice of prayer, the, 
the, the presence of God when we pray? What, what can we do to, to recapture that? A couple of things. Most, most churches, you, you and I both know, most churches there, uh, if they have a prayer meeting, it's an organ recital. You know, pray for Aunt Bessie's ingrown toenails. Uh, pray for Uncle Bob. He's having an appendectomy. I, I just got organ recital. I'm going to use that line. That's funny <laughs> stuff. But here's what I tried to challenge us uh, at Sherwood to do was with the him possible cards, you know, the H-I-M instead of impossible, him possibles, for them to say, okay, what is it that if God doesn't break through, we're sunk. My prodigal will remain a prodigal. My husband will remain lost. I've told him every Sunday he needs to come to church. Uh, my kids will be in rebellion. Uh, I have an addiction uh, to pornography or to drugs or whatever. When we did those impossible cards at, at Sherwood, Chad, we would have over a thousand cards at the altar. Hmm. And I mean, these are church people. No names on them, but some of them were people sitting in the pews saying, my marriage is a wreck. I have addictions. And during the week before refresh, we would always lay those cards out and ask people to just come and pray. Uh, so I think we have to, I wish churches would get a prayer list of lost people. Hmm. You know, just lost people or backslidden church members mm -hmm. that you you haven't seen and I hadn't seen since Jesus left the earth. I mean, you know, uh, they come at Easter and Christmas and that's about it. And we're getting more and more into once a month is faithfulness. <laughs> I'm an active church member once a month. Uh, I think you got to get people praying because we're all passing a baton. Mm. And uh, if we don't pray, if we're not on praying ground, Manly Beasley used to talk about praying ground and that you have to get there. You just don't walk onto it. You have to get yourself there. I think the other thing that pastors are afraid of, well, if we call a prayer meeting, there won't be a big crowd. Hmm. You know, there might be five people that show up. Well, Five people really laying hold of God is more than most churches have now. Uh, five people in a church running 30 that's about to close its door is more than it's doing now. So, I mean, I just see what ha what has happened with Robbie Gallaty at Long Hollow. I mean, it's amazing. You know, but what God did, and I don't know if you've listened to what he did, but but, you know, he went out on his back porch every night for an hour of solitude with God. And then he started calling for Tuesday night prayer meetings. And he said, I didn't think anybody would show up. I think we live in such a time we underestimate people need to feel connected. And prayer connects us vertically and horizontally. And I think if we can say, look, we're going to pray for, I want you to write down the names of, of your lost relatives. And uh, you can just write down the first name. That's fine. So nobody goes, ah, hey, see them at 7-Eleven and go, hey, we prayed for you at Gillianville last night. Uh, write down the names of lost relatives. And we're going to have a time this week or in two weeks where all we're going to do is take these names and pray over them. Hmm. Um, it has to be a little more creative. And uh, I would say that for me, I kind of let go of the prayer ministry. Uh, when I was at Sherwood, I passed it on to staff members because I thought, well, they can run the prayer ministry. They're, they're good guys and everything else. And I went to a prayer event in Austin, Texas at Kai Bowman's church, hmm. who has a phenomenal prayer ministry. In fact, for the whole city of Austin, that there are churches across denominational lines that are praying by the hundreds uh, for God to move in Austin. They want it to be called the praying city. Hmm. 
And uh, we went to that event and there were 16 national leaders. There were like 30 of us in the room. And there were 16 national leaders. And I will never forget that every one of them said, the pastor has to lead it. Hmm. He can delegate the logistics but his voice has to be the voice calling the church to prayer. He has to lead it. You can't delegate the leadership of the prayer ministry in the church. And I went, okay, wow. So, you know, I got to take this back and I've got to, I got to figure this out. Um, and it, it, you know, it helped, it helped stem the tide of us going in the wrong direction. Mm. Well, I'm excited to get into the subject and the topic. I know I'm excited to lead, you know, my people through the next month of just focusing on prayer together. I'm really grateful for you giving your time today and just hearing kind of your opinions on things. Again, I've missed this so much. Uh, I appreciate your fellowship, your friendship, your mentorship, um, you know, through the years. And I know we're very public right now in this format, but that being said, I want to kind of end this way. Is there any way that we can be praying for you? And for your family right now? Yeah, um, uh, just a couple of things. I've got a PET scan coming up December 9th, and that's going to tell us how these treatments have worked over the last year. I mean, we'd really like God to step in and just say they're working great, or it looks like it, the cancer's gone, especially in my third go around with this. Um, and then you know, Haley's fostering a child. And I think just the challenges of all that as a single foster mom, uh, just the overwhelming nature of work, fostering everything else uh, are the two big things that are kind of hot on our hearts right now. I'll be praying for you in that. And no, I'm praying for you as you travel. I know I see you, you know, speaking a lot of places and having opportunities to uh, kind of share with with younger pastors and, and leaders uh, there where you are now. And we're praying for you. Uh, so appreciate you, Michael. Thanks for your time this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to let you go and let everybody on the live stream go. Uh, we'll see you guys uh, same time next week with another guest unpacking and working through this topic of prayer together. God bless you, Michael. Thanks, Chad. Love you, man. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.